Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. My name is uh, Sir Buckley. I'm the author of several books on psychology. This is the most well known of them. Malignant self love, narcissism and religious life. I look at that online. This is the end of the club. Now to the lecture. <laughs> Please, if you could all uh, rise. Stand up. You can sit down. Why did you get up? You, why did you get up? Because I asked you. Okay. Any other question? Why did you get up? Authority. Authority. Yes. You? Why did you get up? Respect. 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 Respect to authority. Yes. Or you didn't want to embarrass me. You didn't want me to, to shame you. Yes? Mm -hmm. I see. Maybe you want to be good start. Respect that you say, get up, we get up. <laughs> if I say get up, you get up. I'll tell you to jump out the window and jump out the window. <laughs> For first time, you can make Okay. I have lectured in many, many countries, as you can imagine. And I can tell you that there are countries in which almost no one would get up. For example, the country that I come from, Israel. If I tell a group of Israelis in a lecture, same setting, authority figure, audience, and so on, if I tell them get up, one or two will get up in a group like this, and the others will say, why? What for? Why do you want us to get up? What will happen after that? Where are you leading? Etc. etc. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, it's very, very important the culture and society that people come to you as therapists or as psychologists. Some of you will become therapists, some of you will become psychologists, some of you will become normally it's Macedonian politicians. But those of you who become therapists and psychologists will encounter people, patients, other therapists, colleagues, and so on and so forth. Always ask yourself, what is the cultural and social background of your patient? It is critical. Don't think that this is a secondary issue. It is actually the first issue that you should ask yourself. Macedonia belongs to this group of, of societies and cultures. Conformist, collectivist, you care very much about what other people say about you care very much about other people's opinions. You are embedded in a community and you define yourself, your self-identity is derived from your relationships with others, with your family, with your generation, with your colleagues, with your friends, and so on. So you are collectivist. You are consensual. You are conflict averse. You don't like conflict. You try to avoid conflict at all costs. Sometimes too much cost. You are consensual. And you are hierarchical authoritative, as I just proved to you. I stood here, I'm an authority figure. Whatever that means. I told you to get, get up. All of you got up. All of you got up. Not one of you remained seated. So, you, are, you respond to authority. Contra to that. And, and so, these societies, some of them are very, very accomplished societies, such as Japan. Japan is identical. It's also conformist, collectivist, consensual, etc., etc. So the Japanese are the same. Here, you would put, for instance, Israel. Some parts of the United States, not all. In the south, southern United States is more like this. But East Coast and northern United States are more like this. These societies are individualistic. They do not respect authority, they doubt authority. They question authority, so they are defiant. And they are narcissistic. They pursue their own goals, accomplishments, and desires, and benefits at the expense of others. They are exploitative, and so on. These are examples of two types of societies. If you have an Albanian patient and a Macedonian patient, these would require two completely different treatment approaches, treatment plans, completely different considerations. If you have someone from Turkey, 
and someone from Israel. Again, two completely different plans of treatment, approaches, techniques, which techniques to use. Gestalt is for one type of patient. You know. Cognitive behavioral therapy is for another. You can't use all the treatment options, all the treatment modalities with all the patients. Today what I'm going to do, I'm going to discuss five topics in psychology, like this one, culture and society and so on, five issues in psychology, and I'm going to demonstrate these issues via little known, little known, mental health disorders. Disorders that you cannot find in the diagnostic and statistical manual, and disorder, or disorders that are so rare that there are few people in the world with these disorders, but each disorder will teach us something about human nature, the human mind, and you as therapists, or teachers of psychology, or psychologists, or whatever. Let's start with culture and society. We have something called culture-bound syndromes. Culture-bound syndromes mean syndromes, mental health problems, that are unique to specific locations in the world. When such a patient emigrates to the United States and goes to a psychiatrist or a therapist, this kind of patient will not be understood because his disorder, the pattern of abnormal behavior, is unique to his culture, society, and geography. Cannot be found anywhere else in the world. I'll give you four very brief examples. Each example, I will write down the name of the disorder, and you, if you want to, can look it up later on the internet or in books and learn more about it, if you want. It's up to you. Ordered market. <laughs> the first one is called ZAR. ZAR is when a patient comes and claims to have been possessed by a demon. It's possession, in effect. But not possession like in Western society. In Western society, the demon is an external hostile entity. It is an entity that is evil malicious, takes over someone's body in order to use the body for its own purposes. Zal is something different. Zal is a disorder which we find in Iran, Ethiopia, other parts of the Middle East and so on. Zal is an intimate relationship between the patient and his or her demon. It's a little like a couple, like a couple. The patient has intimate knowledge of the demon, develops a relationship with the demon, accommodates herself or himself to the demon, and they live together happily ever after in the same body. They are sharing the same body. It's like someone once defined friendship. That's what is friendship. Friendship is two souls in the same body. Aristoteles. Aristoteles said, friendship is two souls in the same body. Two souls in the same body is Zara. When such a person comes to you, the best treatment technique would be couples therapy. I'm not kidding. Couples therapy. So it is a form of possession unique to special geographies. You're not likely, you're not likely as therapist to come across someone with ZAR. But it shows you that mental health is not a science in the sense. Yes. Cultural. Talking about <laughs> ZAR. <yes. laughs> Mental health is not a science with strict quantifiable elements. It's not like physics. Mental health depends where, who, when, when also, as you will see later. It's very fluid. It's a little like art, closer to art than to science. Although, if you go to the Western universities, the psychologists there will be very angry. They will say, no, no, it's a science. We have now machines that measure the blood flow in the brain, so it's a science. That's, of course, a joke. We'll come to it later. Psychology has never been a science and never will be a science. Psychology is about human beings. When human beings are involved, we don't have science. We have observations. Yes, we have observations. We can even systematize the observations, but we can never make a science out of it, which we will come to later. Another example is called... That's a tough one. 
They are all examples of cultural, yes? They are very, they are shame driven. It's a society that is shame driven, embarrassment driven. The main thing in Japanese society, as in Arab society, by the way, and some other societies, is shame. To avoid shame, to avoid embarrassment, to avoid disgrace. You know, people not to talk about you, etc., etc. So Japanese are like that. This disorder, Aijin Kyofushu, means. My body is an embarrassment. It is the belief that the patient develops that his body causes other people embarrassment. Not him, but the body causes other people embarrassment. So for instance, he believes that he has a bad smell. His body exudes a bad smell. Or his body is ugly, very ugly. And he is not concerned about himself is concerned that other people are inconvenienced, that other people feel bad because they are exposed to bad smell or to ugly person. That is strictly Japanese. I think it would be very difficult to find in other societies. Something you even are familiar with because it existed in Macedonian society until recently, maybe even today. Maldeoko. Maldeoko means evil eye. Evil eye. Evil eye means if you have a baby or a child and someone, someone looks at the baby or the child and is jealous. Jealous that you have a baby or jealous that the baby is beautiful or jealous that the baby is healthy and so on. That person who is looking at the baby gives the baby the evil eye. It's called Madre Ojo, and it's common in Spain, Portugal, and Latin America, and so on. It is a mental health disorder, because the person, the person who believes in Madre Ojo develops total paranoid ideation. Total paranoia. It's a paranoid spectrum disorder, but unique to Spanish-speaking provinces. There was something like that in Macedonia, oh Evil Eye. And we say poo poo poo. Yes. <laughs> in Spain, and by the way, in Spanish, Spanish, for instance, Spanish Jews that emigrated to Turkey. My mother is, is a Turkish Jew. Spanish, Turkish Jew. She emigrated from, her family emigrated from Spain to Turkey. So they brought with them the Balde Oko to Turkey. So the Spanish Jews in Turkey, the Ladino Jews, have this, Balde Oko. And these societies developed huge rituals, treatment modalities in psychotherapy, rituals outside psychotherapy, and whole codes of conduct to avoid mal de ojo. It's a whole science of how to avoid mal de ojo. I will give you one example. If a baby becomes sick after a neighbor saw him and gave him the mal de ojo, so there's a neighbor, she saw the baby, she gave him mal de ojo, baby became sick. Why she? Only she. Do you know men with, with evil eye? <laughs> Yes, this is culture. See, it's a cultural artifact. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I asked. Absolutely, it's a cultural artifact. It's a gender, gender discriminatory approach, gender prejudice. But I'm mentioning she all the time because Mande Oko, the people who cast Mande Oko are exclusively women. That's not connected to me. <laughs> That's the sun. I was sure about it. Exclusively women. So if this neighbor woman cast Mande Oko on the baby, the baby becomes sick. There is a whole procedure. The baby has to be sold to another family. Sold for one coin. So they take the baby to another family, they give the baby, they take a coin. And the baby changes his name. Why? To deceive the devil. <laughs> so when the devil looks for him, for Jorge, he will not find him because Jorge changed the name. The baby changed the name. 
and these babies are called Melkada or Melkado. If you come across someone in Spain, Portugal, Latin America, Brazil, and so on, called Mercado or Mercada, means that he is a sold baby. He was sold because of Maldeo, he or she. For real? For re sold for a coin. And for that real? Family, Not that for a ritual, for real? It's a ritual, but that family becomes also his family. Like whom? A little like... Madre mia. <laughs> Madre mia. Finally, the last example I will give you, although there are many, is homosexuality. And this time, in the West. You, I don't know if you know, that until 1980, 1980, not 1880, 1980, homosexuality was considered a mental illness. It was defined as a mental health diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, Edition 3. So if you, if you get a copy of Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, Edition 3, you will find, among the other mental health problems, paranoia, schizophrenia, I don't know what, you will find homosexuality. So homosexuality was a mental illness in the West. Actually, it was also a criminal offense in Britain until the 1940s, in Switzerland until the 1950s, in the United States until the 1920s, and so on and so forth. But that's besides the point. More importantly, it was a mental health problem. People were treated for homosexuality. They were taken to psychiatrists and therapists, and the psychiatrists and therapists tried to teach them to love women if they were men, or to love men if they were women. This is nice case. And there were bad cases yes. for treatment. And there were, no, that I said criminal people were put in jail. Oscar Wilde, of course. No, no. Alan, Alan Turing. Alan Turing to committed electric shocks. Committed suicide after it, yes. So uh, Turing, by the way, will be mentioned later. So uh, homosexuality is an example of culture-bound syndrome. In Western society, homosexuality was considered to be a mental illness. In others, no. Not at all. Okay. This is issue number one, culture versus society. I would like two volunteers to come here, and if no one comes here, I will choose, like in the Israeli army. <laughs> <laughs> two volunteers? I'm looking at you. I have to shoot. I can't not you, not you. You are, okay. <laughs> you are too knowledgeable. <laughs> I have to be careful with you. <laughs> Of course you, I'm looking at you half an hour. Uh, and a woman. No, woman? With Maldeo. I'm looking for a woman. I'm looking for a woman. You were, you were treated. Actually, no. Please be seated. You will be in the next demonstration. Okay? So, sorry, you, you have been chosen, but okay. <laughs> Don't worry. Do you speak English? So, so? so, so. Uh, may, uh, maybe we should have someone who speaks English. Well. Uh, yeah. Come. For this demonstration, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. For next demonstration, I believe one. I will ask you for next demonstration. I have to do that? Please. I want you to prove, prove to me that you are real. Verbally or? Any way you choose. Prove to me that you are real. I don't believe you are real. Oh, I am sure. That's not very convincing. Prove it. Uh, they can uh, see me. They can hear me. It's real. Okay. Yeah. It's real. <laughs> We take a coffee break. No. <laughs> it's only you and me. Okay. I want you to prove to me that you're right. Not to them. Uh, you can see me. Uh, you can hear me. Uh, I can touch you. You can touch me. Maybe you can smell me. If you're closer. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe uh, you can. Feel something about me or I about you? You heard of uh, you heard of course of uh, hallucinations. Yes. So maybe I'm hallucinating that you're here. <laughs> I'm hallucinating that you're touching me. I'm hallucinating. I suppose you're meant to be caught. It's very wrong. <laughs> very wrong. <laughs> very wrong <laughs> assumption. Uh, I don't think that. 
Yeah. Just let us. Uh -huh. Just let us. Okay. Lydia, finish Lydia. this. Lydia. Finish this. Okay. After that, Lydia, leave it to the. Lydia? Yes. I'm surrounded. All Lydia's are surrounded. Real. 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 So Lydia, Lydia is trying to convince me that she's real, and she says that I see her. But we have hallucinations where people think that they see something and it's not there. She says that I can touch her, and we have type of hallucination that's called tactile hallucination, where we can touch something and it's not there. She says I can hear her, and of course the most common form of hallucination is auditory hallucinations, where we can hear voices, but they are not there, including voices that tell us to kill our family, and we kill our whole family, entire family, but there was no such voice. So auditory hallucinations, tactile hallucinations, visual hallucinations, at this stage I'm not convinced that you're real. Can you find where, something? where you are. Can you find something, something that will convince me completely that you're real? Beyond, beyond doubt. Not possible to be hallucination. No. No? No, I'm not, I'm not vouching for any philosophical system. I'm asking you to convince me that you're real. You told me that I can see you, not convince you. you. told me that I can touch you, not convince you. you. told me that I can hear you, not convince you. Do you have anything that will convince me that you're real? Do you want I, uh, uh, I to be real? Do I want you to be real? Oh, yeah. Or you don't want you? If I want you to be real, it makes things even worse. Because it means... <laughs> <laughs> then maybe you're really I'm having a mistake. What we call voluntary illness. So, the thing, is, the thing is this. There is no way... No. She can convince me that she's real. Philosophically. Yes. Uh, just to jump in real quick. So, um, the, major the majority in a culture makes the objective be of something. We'll come to that. Exactly. So, yeah, we it's call not it about you, it's about us. It's true. When, when we all it's see true. her and touch her. It's very true. We'll come to yeah. One on one, or one on one many, doesn't matter, because there is something called shared psychosis, where a group of people develop hallucination, common hallucination to all of them. Yes. So, there is no way to convince me or you as a group that she is real. No way. Since you are not real, you can be <laughs> So, how do we know that she is real? How do we know that Lydia is real? How do we know that Lydia is real? What's your name? senses, through our eyes, ears, smell, taste, etc., etc. We call all this information coming through the senses, sensor. Many sensor together are sensorium. When we have an overwhelming, a lot, of sensor, organized, not only sensor, but organized in a sensorium, in a matrix, or in a pattern, we decide, totally arbitrarily, that this is real. Reality is therefore a convention. A convention. Something we decide, totally arbitrarily, based on sensory input that is organized in a certain way. Lydia gives me sensory input. Voice, I can see her, she touched me, etc., etc. But this sensory input was not random input. It was organized in the form of Lydia. The, it came from the same direction. When she said, I'm touching you, I also felt the touch. So there was correlation between the... Her mobile is ringing, despite the sign. So here's another... When you put all the sensor together in a matrix, that is consistent, no part contradicts the other. 
that is coherent. The parts sit together and create a story, narrative, we call it. And that is uh, strong, so we call it a strong sens sensorium, uh, that cannot be explained by any other way, in any other way. When we have this, we say that this is real. But there is no way to prove it. We cannot prove reality. There are mental states, like psychosis, schizophrenia paranoia, yes. and other mental states, not only psychosis. We, I'll give you a few examples. Maybe to silence it would be a good idea. I don't know how to do it because it's not. Ah, let me have a step on it. <laughs> <laughs> Perception that something or someone is real depends not only on sensors that are organized, but also depends on your state of mind. I can give you a drug, and your state of mind will change. Your sensorium will change, and perception of reality will change. You can become psychotic, especially if you listen to the lecture to the end. You can become psychotic, your perception of the world will change, perception of reality will change. There are dozens of mental health conditions where perception of reality changes. The other option is, the other option is to answer. Or you can answer. If it's not it's, it's new, I don't know how to... Yeah. But you can answer also, if it's not right. That will prove that you're real. No, it's not. I mean, uh, hallucination that answers the phone. <laughs> Too much. So, now I'll give you a few examples of mental health conditions where reality itself is in question. Not only perception of reality, but reality itself is in question. These patients will never agree with you about reality. Never mind what you do, never mind which technique you use, never mind which treatment option, modality. They, you cannot reach agreement with them on, on reality. I'll give you a few examples. <coughs> All these examples, as I told you at the beginning, are rare conditions, conditions that are very rare. You are not likely to come across them in practice ever. But it's interesting that they exist, because they teach us something. <laughs> Capgras delusion. Capgras delusion is, all of them are named after the doctor who discovered them. Capgras delusion is the delusion that your wife, husband, family members, pet, pet, your dog, is not really your wife, husband, family member or pet, but has been taken over by aliens or by another entity. So if I had Capgras delusion, I would look at Lydia, my wife, and I would say she looks like Lydia, she talks like Lydia, she smells like Lydia and moves like Lydia, but I know very well that it's not Lydia. It's an alien who took over her body and is using her body to communicate with me, to do something to me, and so on. Kapka's delusion is the delusion that there is an imposter inside the body of people who are close to you or even your pets. It's that bad. And nothing you can do will convince these people that your wife is your wife. What are you talking about? It's your wife. Nothing should... No, no, it's not my wife. It's an alien. It's a, an imposter. It's, this is Kapgar's delusion. Psychosis. Now, this is something much more common. Psychosis or psychotic syndrome is a part of a much bigger disorder called uh, schizophrenia paranoia. Psychosis is a situation where figments, fragments of the personality and the sensor that go with them are projected outside. So it's like a breakdown, disintegration of the personality. The fragments, it's like explosion, personality exploded. The fragments of the personality were thrown all over, and each one of them is attached to some kind of sensor. <coughs> so it could be auditory. 
this kind of person would hear voices. Uh, it could be visual, so he would see visions, etc., etc. This is psychosis. It's also a condition that denies reality. Because these people are convinced beyond any doubt that what they hear, what they see, what they touch is real. But it's not there, of course. Not only are they convinced that it's real, they act as though it is real. So if a voice tells you to do something, you do it. If you see something, you walk around it. It's very common. One of the tests in, uh, in uh, initial therapy of psychotic people is to ask them if they see something. They say yes, so I see and what, a big thing. And to ask them to, to walk into it. And so they do this. They walk around. It's one of the initial tests. So psychosis is an example of denial of reality. Shared psychosis. Shared psychosis is, is the new term for fully a deux. Fully a deux or fully a plusieurs. Which in French means going crazy in two or going crazy in, in a lot. In many, many people go crazy. Folie à deux, folie à plusieurs, now known as shared psychosis, is psychosis, is classic psychosis, with auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, and so on and so forth. Paranoid, persecutory delusions, paranoid hallucinations. Someone is chasing me, the CIA is bugging me, Gwerski is after me, you know, this kind of thing. <laughs> shared psychosis. Yeah. So, I'm not politically... <laughs> It's Miyalkov, not Gorsky. Miyalkov is chasing me. <laughs> <laughs> it would be precise. In my case, in my case it could be true. <laughs> so, the, it's a psychosis that is shared by more than one person. Usually there is one dominant person. This person is called the host. So one dominant person. And this dominant person infects the others. Exactly like epidemic. Infects the others. We have this in cults. In cult settings. We have shared psychosis. So, for instance, the famous case of 900 and something people who drank poison. Jones, the famous, uh, so he, he said the world is ending. The world will end in two days. And before the world ends, better to commit suicide. 900 and something people committed suicide. Some of them voluntarily, some of them not so. But a few hundred volunteered to commit suicide because they believed that in two days the world is ending. So, this is shared psychosis. Now, shared psychosis is auditory, visual, and so on and so on, but mostly paranoid. Shared psychosis is usually paranoid. But the important thing is not, not to define now, but the important thing is these people lose touch with reality. Their reality is different. If, if I am uh, in an ev evangelical church in the United States, I could induce shared psychosis in my congregation towards Lydia claiming that she is the devil. And there are documented cases like this. Hundreds. Isolating a single person in the congregation and saying she's the devil and inducing shared psychosis towards her. So it's, it involves paranoia, basically. But lack of contact with reality. Anton Babinski. Anton Babinski syndrome. Anton Babinski syndrome is someone who is blind. The patient is blind, cortically blind. The optical nerve, the cortex are dead. There is no electrical activity in the brain, in the optical regions. The optical nerve is completely dead. But the person insists that he is seeing or she is seeing. They insist that nothing is wrong with them. They can see anything and everything. Even though they are totally blind. So, to compensate for their blindness, because they're blind, they can't see anything, but they claim that they see any, everything. So to compensate for that, they create a whole reality in their mind. They create a reality that they believe is outside themselves. And they walk in this reality, which is completely in their head. They walk in this reality as though they see, like they see. We call this the Anton Babinski syndrome. Again, denial of reality. And finally, a very bizarre syndrome. Pseudo-insomnia. It's 
also called st sleep state misperception. Again, remember what we're talking about. We're talking about mental health disorders where there cannot be agreement on what is reality. If such a person comes to your office as therapist, you cannot begin to talk to them because there's no agreement what is reality. You can't, it's the, the modes of communication are closed. In psychosis, first you have to treat with medication and only then you can start talk therapy because of that. Because there's no agreement on reality. If you tell the psychotic person you are not hearing anything, what are you talking about? God is talking to me, you know? Can't you hear? They say, usually they say in treatment, can't you hear? You know? Can't you hear the voices? So you have to treat them with medication first. Pseudo-insomnia, or sleep state misperception, is when someone is asleep but thinks that he's awake. And they are convinced that they are awake. And when they wake up in the morning, they say, I didn't sleep one minute. It's horrible. And their body reacts as, uh, as though they slept. Their body is well rested and there's no problem, no reaction to, but psychologically they become more and more and more tired. They become sluggish, they can hardly move, they sit a lot, they develop uh, psychosomatic, psychogenic symptoms like tachycardia and so on because they didn't sleep. And they didn't sleep and they, they begin to faint, they begin to collapse, and finally they die. They sleep well, by the way. These people sleep very well. But they are convinced that they are awake. They wake up in the morning, they didn't wake up, they're, they're still awake. <coughs> this is called pseudo-insomnia. Here is a disagreement on reality. You tell them, but listen, you're asleep. Here's a video. You see, you're asleep. Here's your, your EEG patterns, electricity patterns in the brain. You see that you're asleep. You know, there are different waves when you're asleep. You see that you're asleep. Here's a video of you asleep. Nada. They, are not, they did not sleep. They know they did not sleep. You're cheating them. You're inventing something. This is called pseudo-insomnia. She's feeling wet. How do you know it is the same feeling? No, I don't. But how do you know that she is feeling wet like you are feeling wet? How do you know it's the same feeling? She's, she's a person. And you're a person. That's common basis. So, tell me. Are you the same person? You're, you're persons. Are you the same person? No. 
So how do you know that her witness is your witness? How do you know that the way, the way, natural, that she feels wet, is the same way that you feel wet? Because I know that she has, a, she is a normal with normal feelings, and she has nothing. So. Uh, so what you're saying is this. Actually, let me translate you. You're saying we are two identical machines. <laughs> we are the same machines. We are machines with programming to react in certain ways. So we are. You're saying we are. You're saying we are identical. Because look, if you are not identical. You cannot know anything about it. If you are not identical in every bit, every iota, every atom, every molecule, if you are not exactly the same, you cannot know how she feels wet. But if you are identical, if you are two copies of the same machine, iPhone 6, iPhone 6, <laughs> that machines, machines are the same. Even machines are not the same. If you ever work with machines, you know that. Each machine has its own personality. But okay, machines are the same. If I take my, my laptop to this technician, that technician, that technician, that technician, we all know what to do. Machines are the same. Are people machines? No. How do you know that she feels wet like you feel wet? The answer is you don't know. You don't know. You don't know that she feels... You will never know. You don't know that she feels wet the same way. You don't know that she feels pain the same way. You don't know that she sees the color red the same way like you. You can agree to call this red, but that's it. You don't know that she experiences red the same way you experience red. There is Daltonism, color blindness. Two people looking at red, they will both call it red. But the Daltonist experiences red differently, so we don't know. Thank you. Um. If we don't know, if we don't know anything about another person, any single thing, what do we do? We project what we know of ourselves onto another. All human relationships are projection. All of them. Projection, as you know, is a defense mechanism in psychology where we attribute to other people what is going up, what is going in our mind, in our minds. Something is going up in our, in our own mind, and we say it must be the same with her. It must be the same with him. This is projection. Sometimes projection is pathological. So if I'm a very jealous person, I would say my wife is very jealous. That is projection. I'm actually jealous, but I'm projecting. This is pathological projection. But there is non-pathological projection, normal projection. And this normal projection we call empathy. Empathy is when we put ourselves in someone else's shoes, we say, how would it be to be Lydia? How would it be to be Lydia? So we put, I put myself in her shoes for a minute. I project myself. But it's important to remember, I project myself. I will never know what it means to be Lydia, ever, in principle. No human communication is possible. When we communicate, we exchange symbols and we agree on the symbols, but not on the people. When I talk to one of you, we exchange symbols. I give you words, you give me words, and we agree on the words, but I don't know anything about you. And you cannot know anything about me, ever. Now this approach, is known in psychology, in uh, philosophy, sorry, as solipsism. Solipsism is the belief of school is, uh, in philosophy that says that essentially the only object of knowledge, the only thing we can know anything about is us, me. I can know, maybe, 
I can know some things about me, but zero about you, and nothing about reality, and nothing about the world. Only thing I can say for sure is this. This is the only thing I can say for sure. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. I cannot prove that you are, I cannot prove that you are, I cannot prove anything. But I can prove, and only to myself, that I exist. Because if I don't exist, who is thinking this? If I don't exist, who is thinking I don't exist? For me to think I don't exist, I must first exist. The machine. Sorry? The machine thinks. It's a, mach it's a machine like perception, yes. But Every sentence comes from existence. So if even the sentence I don't exist proves that I exist because I have to say it. So this is solipsism. This, by the way, was said by Descartes. <laughs> no, I know that you do. So this is solipsism. Now, as I told you, we know everything about ourselves and nothing about other people. So how do we manage? How do we function? A society, as group, you're all here together listening to me, I'm talking to you, I assume that you exist. And why? What is all this? This is something we call the intersubjective agreement. Stefan, this is the agreement you talked about. Stefan mentioned an agreement. This agreement is called the intersubjective agreement. You are subject, I am subject. We, uh, people are called subjects in uh, philosophy, and they are called objects in psychology, by the way. Very interesting. <laughs> in psychology, we call them objects. In philosophy, we call them subjects. So, uh, in philosophy, we say that <coughs> subjects, subjects, people, make agreement about the world. You can ask, and how do we know that this agreement is correct? Because it works. We don't know that it is correct. We know that it's, it's working. Not lately. Not lately. No. We make agreement, an agreement between us about reality, and we don't know if it is correct agreement. We don't know if it is really reality. For instance, I make an agreement with you about what it is to be human. I am weight, you are weight, what it is to be human. You are feeling weight, I'm feeling weight. This is agreement. Do I know it's true? No. Because I don't know how you feel weight. And I, I know only how I feel weight. I don't know if it's true. But I know that it's working because we can agree that we are both wet after a cold water. Understand? It's agreement. This agreement, don't make a mistake, is not true. It's not correct. It's not real. This agreement between people about what is reality and what it means to be human. What it means to be human. This agreement is not real, not true, not correct. It's functional. It's working. Okay, again I will give you a few examples. Uh, you want them to take a break and continue? Or? I think it's better to have a little break, five, ten okay. minutes. Okay. I'll give you a few examples and after that we take a break. Those who survive and come back. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a few mental health issues that demonstrate that we can't access other people. That, we, that the agreement about what is to be human, the agreement about what is reality, is totally arbitrary. There's no one can see arbitrary. Yeah. Totally arbitrary and only functional. Doesn't have to be real. So, start with a disorder called Kotaro. Syndrome, in the Kotal, patient with Kotal syndrome, 
believes that she already died. I'm saying she because uh, two thirds of patients are women. Believes that she already died, or believes that she doesn't have a body, or believes that she doesn't have parts of the body. She believes she doesn't have a, a, a heart or brain. But it's not believed now. She behaves as though she doesn't have a body. So she walks around and she refuses to eat. So I don't need to eat. I don't have a body. I don't have a body. Or I don't have parts of the body. So for instance, if she says I don't have a stomach, I don't need to eat. Or I don't have a brain, so I don't need to watch or read. Or... There's been the first case of Kotal reported in the 19th century it was a woman, we don't know her name, but she was identified in the literature as Mademoiselle X. Of course, a Frenchman discovered it. So, as Mademoiselle X. And Mademoiselle X died because she refused to eat. And she refused to eat because she said she doesn't have a stomach and intestines. And she wouldn't eat. What is way to eat? So she didn't eat. She died of starvation. Of hunger. She was a rich woman. But she didn't eat. Why is this? How is this relevant? People with Kotal syndrome don't accept the intersubjective agreement. You remember we have intersubjective agreement, what is to be human. They don't accept this agreement of what is to be human. For them, it's possible to be human without a body. Possible to be human without a brain. These people didn't say I'm not human. They didn't say I'm alien. They said I'm human, but I don't have a body. Well, so they did not accept the intersubjective agreement that we all have about what is to be human. This is Cotard. And indeed, in French, it's called délire de négation, the delusion of negation. So they negate their humanity. They don't accept their subject, subjective Another example is Saxonia. Saxonia is a Sexonia, also known as sleep sex, sounds good. <laughs> Absolutely. Sexonia, sleep sex, is having sex while you are truly and deeply asleep. Not pretending to be asleep, not half asleep, hypnagogic or hypnopompic, you know, the two stages between sleep and waking up. Not hypnagogic sleep, not hypnopompic sleep, it means between waking and Sleeping, but deep sleep, extremely deep, dreamless sleep, non rapid eye movement sleep, dreamless. Delta phase of sleep. Yes, the deepest phase of sleep. And during this phase, the person has sex, orgasm, everything. I cannot make a demonstration <laughs> on this particular issue. It's for our homework. No, I forgot, simply forgot. Homework. Yeah, homework. <laughs> but sexonia, sleep, sleep sex. And these people have sex and everything, and even there were many cases, several cases, of uh, impregnating pregnancy that resulted from sexonia, and there have been at least seven documented cases of rape. Rape, where the rapist was exonerated based on sexonia. It's a real condition. Now, why am I mentioning this condition here, sexomnia? Because there is no agreement. The intersubjective agreement breaks. The intersubjective agreement says to be human is to have a body. People with Kotal say, no, I'm human, I don't have a body. The intersubjective agreement says to have sex, you must be fully awake. And, you know, sex means a meeting not only of the bodies, but also of the minds. Not to mention condoms. So. <laughs> So, these people say, no, I can have sex while I'm totally asleep, while I'm not there. I can have sex without being there. Now, that is way outside the intersubjective agreement. They challenge the intersubjective agreement, again. And finally, there is a very much more famous and much more common condition called fugue, fugue state. This you see in movies also. Fugue state is, uh, uh, you have a life, you have a family, you have work, you have everything, and then suddenly you wake up, 
completely elsewhere, with another family, another work, other memories, another life completely. And then you wake up in that life, you continue that life, and a few months later, you kind of wake up from, from this dream, and you go back to your first life. These are called fugue states, fugue states. They are actually sub subcondition of something called dissociation, dissociative disorders. The most extreme form of dissociative disorder is known as dissociative identity disorder, which before that was called multiple personality disorder. So the most extreme form is dissociative identity, and this is considered a benign form. Benign because most fugues last a few minutes to a few hours. Very extreme fugues last up to eight months. There is no known case more than eight months. Ten is any. Ten. The single longest case in literature is ten months. Fugue state. That person, ten months, was a man. He's a traveling salesman. He was under huge uh, stress because he was about to lose his job. It usually happens after stress. He was to lose his job and so on. So he fugued out, disconnected, dissociated, cut himself from his life, moved to another city, found another job, met a woman, married her and had a child with her. Ten months later, he reverted, we call it reversion, he moved back and he woke up to his first life, not knowing anything about his new wife and his child and his work and his home. He was shocked to find himself in a totally foreign environment. Why am I mentioning this? Because our intersubjective agreement, the agreement about what it means to be human, Intersubjective agreement means agreement about what is it to be human. The agreement says to be human is to have continuity, to have a biography, to have continuity, to have memory, to have a continuous memory. Without continuous memory, we cannot be human. We, I repeat, without continuous memory of, of our life, we cannot have identity. Identity is memory. Also in the political sphere, not case, nations and so on. Without memory, there's no identity. That's why nations, especially new nations, come up with history. They need history. They need memory. Monuments. They need? Monuments. They need monuments as well, yes. It's a legitimate part of inventing history. So, intersubjective agreement is about memory, identity, who we are. But here are these people, they say I'm human, I'm human, I'm human, but I don't have continuous identity. I'm here, I'm there, this family, this family, I don't remember anything. I don't, I'm human. And this leads to the question, people with dissociative identity disorder, multiple personalities, 40 personalities, the most extreme case, malignant, 80 personalities, 80. Are these humans? In which sense are they human? Don't they challenge the intersubjective agreement completely? Of these 80 personalities of Robert Mulligan, 23 were children, 17 were women, 26 were men, 43 were above the age of 18, 12 were above the age of 17, 2 were infants less than 6 months. All of them were Robert Mulligan. Who is Robert Mulligan? Is he human being? In which sense? This intersubjective agreement breaks down when we confront such people. We can't understand. There's no way we can understand it. It's not that he's pretending to be a baby or that he's pretending to be a woman. It's a real personality. It comes out really. It's, he really becomes a woman. He really becomes a baby. He really becomes old man. Real. Totally real. Each personality has its history, its memories, its fears, its artistic talents, knows languages that the other personalities don't know, etc., etc. We're talking about 80 people, 80 distinct people in one body. Do we agree to call this person a human being? He has 80 personalities in one body. Intersubjective agreement breaks down in front of such people, completely. Okay. We take a break. If any of you comes back, which would be a major surprise, we will continue. <laughs> Thank you.
questions are very complicated. Write a poem. Or let's talk. Or how do you feel today? And why? And so on and so on. The questions are very non-structured because machines, computers, have advantage when it comes to structure. Uh, okay? Chess, mathematics. So there are no such questions. Questions are highly human questions. And so the computer, for instance, wrote a poem. It's not easy. Try. You try. You're humans. You try to write a poem. Wrote a poem. Describe its mood. Its mood, sorry. Describe its mood. Chatted, chatted with the three professors and so on. And in last year, for the first time in human history, a machine, a computer, based on Watson, IBM's Watson, cheated, deceived three professors into believing that it is the human and the human is the computer. And now we have, finally, according to Turing, surely artificial intelligence. And this leads us to a very interesting question. That is a question known in French philosophy and French psychology. Because in France, by the way, philosophy and psychology are very mixed disciplines. There is no distinction like in the United States where everything is very technical between technical philosophy and technical psychology. But it's very mixed. So if you have people like Derrida and Baudrillard and so on, they would write, oh, Foucault, they would write equally on philosophy and psychology and mix the two. And it's flowing flows all the time, as used to be the case before scientific psychology was invented in the middle of the 19th century. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were two twin disciplines, totally mixed. So, uh, in France, it's called the question of the other. L'autre. The other. Now that computers can cheat us, and convince us that they are human, why will we not accept them as human? Why? Because they have metal and silicon and we have cargo? Why are they less human than me? If they are sufficiently good to convince a Harvard professor, let alone three, that they are human, why aren't they human? In which sense these computers are not human? They don't reproduce. They don't have sex. Question of time. Not yet, yes. <laughs> they don't, and many, and many humans don't have also. They don't fall in love. Also, question of time. Did you see the movie Blade Runner? Blade Runner. Androids. Androids. Philip K. Dick, the famous author. Do electric ship uh, dream. Androids there fall in love and have sex and so on. It's really a question of time. It's not doubt about it. Finally, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, there will be androids, robots, machines, computers, whatever you want to call them, who will look exactly like you. They will be with artificial skin or real skin, because today we have 3D printing machines that print real, screen, real skin. Today, I repeat, we have 3D printers that print real skin. So they will have real skin, they will have a body, they will look exactly like you. And it will be, if we have a Tony Naonovsky robot, <laughs> I might get confused. And it's not a question of only getting confused, but in which sense that Tony Naonovsky robot is not human. It will be very difficult. So there's a question of the other. But it goes even deeper than that. Because if I relate to a robot as a human, I relate to all humans as robots. What are you to me? Each one of you. A package. You're a package. Your nerves and muscles and other organs packed nicely in, in shrink wrap skin. And that's it. You claim that you're human. I take your claim as it is. So I take your word for it that you're human. You talk to me, I talk to you. We have intersubjective agreement, which I can have with the machine tomorrow. <coughs> What is your advantage over robots? In which sense are you not robots? <laughs> and the answer is, after many decades of thinking and analyzing and so on, that there is no way for you to prove that you are distinct in any way, shape or form from advanced robots of the future who will look like you, smell like you, act like you, talk like you, and think like you. So, there's a question of the other. Now, why am I mentioning this? 
I said that we relate to others with empathy. The intersubjective agreement, who is human? The intersubjective agreement about who is human? What constitutes human? We call it empathy. If I have empathy, I relate to you by thinking, how is it to be you? How is it to be you? As I'm thinking, how is it to be you? I can relate to you. It's projection, it's not true, it's like it's work, it works. Okay? We've, we've gone through it. What happens with people who have no empathy? Some people have no empathy. Some people have no sex drive, some people have no hair. Some people, especially in politics, have no balls. But what is it? What do you do if you can laugh if you want? What, what, what do we do when there's no empathy? There are people who have no empathy. We are not sure yet whether it's because of genetics, upbringing, childhood abuse, combination of the three, but for some reason, they lack empathy. They are unable, unable to sign the intersubjective agreement. They cannot put themselves in other people's shoes. What happens with these people? We just said that in order to relate to each other as human beings, we need empathy. If, they don't, if you don't have empathy, you cannot relate to other people as human beings. You have to relate to them. You have to relate to them because you need something from other people. You work with other people. You sleep with other people. You have children with other people. You, know, you need other people. You can't isolate yourself completely. My store comes, fixes your television. You can't avoid people, unfortunately. But you can't avoid people. But some of them. But if you don't have empathy, how do you relate to these people? You don't have the intersubjective agreement. Well, you, you relate to them as robots. Simple. You relate to them as avatars. As symbols. As representations. As representations. Symbols. Functions. Functions, if you wish. Avatars. You know? Robots. For you, other people, I mean, if you don't have empathy, other people are there as kind of a function that comes and goes. There is also no object constancy. Object constancy means that even when, I, when you're not with me, you are still in me. She, uh, babies have that. Babies don't have an object constancy. When the mother leaves the room, they begin to cry. Because if mother is not there and they don't see mother, there is no mother. Mother goes, no mother. So, people with no empathy don't have object constancy. If my wife, if I'm, I don't have empathy and, and my wife is here, she is here. But if she is not here, she is not in my mind. They have no object constancy. Some politicians. Politicians? Yeah. Politicians? Uh, it's questionable whether they're human at all. Stop. Here <laughs> <laughs> you need a different kind of agreement. <laughs> Now, the people without empathy are called, <coughs> are called narcissists. Narcissists and people with extreme form of narcissists in a way that is still debatable, but an extreme form of narcissist is what we call psychopaths. Now, this is a complex issue, psychopaths, because there is a big debate. The official category, official diagnostic category is antisocial personality disorder. There is no psychopath. There is no psychopathy in the diagnostic and statistical manner. Only antisocial personality disorder. Psychopathy and sociopathy are terms used mainly by the media and a few scholars, a few psychologists who are not considered orthodox, such as Robert Baer. So, there is a group of psychologists that they insist that there is something called psychopath, but the mainstream orthodoxy says there is no psychopath, there is antisocial person. And in the DSM-5, in the latest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual published last year, 
Narcissism and psychopathy are conflicted. They are not amalgamated, they are not put together completely, but they are kind of on a spectrum. Okay. Narcissists and psychopaths have many traits, but the most important thing, one, if I have to choose a single thing that characterizes them, <coughs> they have no empathy. They don't have empathy. So they are unable to relate to other people. They relate to other people only in as much as these people give them something, in as much as these people are functional in their lives. So mostly it's what I call narcissistic supply, attention. Attention, admiration, adulation, affirmation. But not only. Services. So only then they relate to other people. They don't care about other people's emotions, partly because they have no access to their own emotions. Needs, other people's needs, priorities, preferences, wishes are non-existent because they don't really relate to other people. They relate to the function that other people fulfill in their lives. They relate, it's like through a, through a glass. They don't really touch someone else. They touch the glass beyond, behind which there is someone else. And so they need the glass. They need to interact with the glass, not with the person. So they don't care about the other person's priorities and so on. It makes it, of course, very difficult also to communicate with them, because in order to communicate, we must have an intersubjective agreement. Communication is based on being similar. This is why it would be very difficult to communicate with an octopod from Neptune. Because an octopod from Neptune is not likely to be similar to you. And you will not have a dictionary. But it's easier for me to communicate with Lydia or Zohan or Tony because we have a lot in, a lot in similar. We have a lot together, common. The intersubjective agreement. Narcissists have no empathy they have no intersubjective agreement, they cannot communicate. For them, for the narcissist, everyone else is an alien. Everyone else came from another planet. And they cannot talk to aliens, extraterrestrials. They use the extraterrestrial for services, for narcissistic supply, attention, this, that. But they can't communicate with the aliens. Aren't they lonely? Not really. They are not lonely, because the narcissist is his own object, as we say in psychology. <coughs> when we grow up as children, we begin to notice that there are other people except us. You know, until the age of about two, we are totally solipsistic. We, are, we know only that we exist. Even mother is our extension. Mother, there's no mother and we. There's mother, we. Mother is our continuation. As we grow up, there is a break. It's a very traumatic break. And there is a whole sea of literature after the age of two when the child suddenly notices that the mother is not part of him. The mother is not part of the child. The child suddenly sees that there is mother and there is me. It's a child break, traumatic break, a second birth. And we call this object relations. This is when we have suddenly an object and we relate to it. Narcissists, and psychopaths of course, start, stop before this stage. They don't progress beyond this. They have no object relations, because they have no objects. They are the true solipsists. <coughs> they and they alone exist. There's no one else there. All of you are, for the Nazi, to the Nazis, all of you are kind of dim reflections on distant screens. From time to time, I would touch the screen because I need your function. Touch you, bring you forth, like a computer, exactly, like a touch, touch screen. You touch the screen, bring you forward, use you, and remove my finger, and you should disappear. If you refuse to disappear, it's a malfunction. If you insist on being real with the narcissist, if you say, hey, wait a minute, I'm real. I'm a real human being with my needs, with my wishes, with my hopes, with my fears. The narcissist is... Even, I would say, terrified, as you would be terrified if an icon on the computer would wake up and start talking to you, as you would be terrified, exactly the same. 
Now, in my, in my books on the narcissism, <coughs> I suggested that narcissists and psychopaths don't have empathy, but they have a variant of empathy, which I call cold empathy. Cold empathy. So everyone has warm empathy. Warm empathy goes with emotions. Cold empathy is the ability to fully understand other people, but without emotions. Exactly like I would read the user manual of a laptop. So I would fully understand the laptop, but of course I don't fully love the laptop. Well, it depends which laptop actually. You 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 understand what I mean. So I, I say that the narcissist has cold empathy, the ability to read, read other people like X-ray. It's not like the narcissist has X-ray, red game. And he's able to look at someone and read that person, but in a cold, calculated way, like I would read a manual of a television set or a refrigerator or a laptop and say, oh, this is the person. Now, in order to get him to do this, I need to push this button. These are his buttons. I need to push his button. This is his vulnerability. This is his weakness. These are his fears. These are his needs. And I can push these needs and fears and vulnerabilities to get him to do what I want. And this is what I call cold So there's no emotion. But this is a new suggestion, a new one. And it's still not accepted. The current orthodoxy in psychology is that there is no empathy at all. I don't think it's possible not to have empathy at all, because if you have no empathy at all, how does the narcissist know to manipulate people? Narcissists manipulate people all the time. How can you manipulate if you have nothing in common? I mean, no ability to read someone. So I think there is cold empathy, but definitely not the classic type of empathy. Psychopaths are even worse. While the narcissist regards other people as potentialities, so if I look at you, I, if a narcissist looks at you, he would relate to you as a potential for, let's say, narcissistic supply, or you, or you. All potentials for narcissistic supply. Right now, the narcissist doesn't need supply, so he doesn't activate you. But when he needs supply, he will activate you. How will he activate you? You need compliments, he will give you compliments. You need to feel intelligent, he will make you feel intelligent. You need to feel beautiful, he will tell you you're beautiful, whatever. So whatever it takes, he will push your buttons. He will read you out, like a rental machine, or MRI, or computerized tomography, CT, and then push your buttons. The psychopath doesn't bother, even with it. Psychopath not only lacks empathy, but lacks the wish to interact with people. Narcissist is forced to interact with people because the narcissist needs narcissistic supply. The narcissist needs to be told that he is brilliant, that he is perfect, that he is beautiful, that he is amazing, that he is one of a kind. Narcissist needs this constant adulation, admiration, attention. If he stops getting it, he falls apart, like uh, the vampire. You know. No narcissistic supply, no narcissist. Narcissistic supply is used to regulate the narcissist's sense of self-worth. Self-worth. Some of values. Self-worth. Narcissist, the sense of self-worth of the narcissist fluctuates. One day he thinks he's, uh, he's God, one day he thinks he's you. One day he thinks he's God, one day he's so in order to keep thinking that he's God, which is a good figure, to feel God, he needs constantly people to tell him you're God, you're God, you're God. So he needs people to regulate his sense of self-worth and to keep it euphoric, to keep it on this level. Psychopaths don't need people at all. They don't need narcissistic supply. They don't need people at all. Psychopaths dehumanize and objectify. In other words, they treat people as total objects. They don't expect anything from people. They don't want from you attention, adulation, admiration, nothing. They don't want anything from you. They want to be able to get to you as an object, take you, shake you, get from you what they want. They want money, money, whatever they want from you, sex, whatever. So, Narcissists, uh, psychopaths, they humanize and objectify. 
the extreme form of psychopath, the one we see in movies, the one we see in movies, is of course the psychopathic sadistic serial killer. Most serial killers are sexual sadists, but also have been diagnosed with psychopathy. Robert Hare made 30 years of studies in prisons and uh, interviewed, I think, all the serial killers in the universe. And all of them were, uh, 80, more than 80% of them were diagnosed as psychopaths, as well as some of them, small minority, were sexual sadists. Now, the serial killer objectifies to the maximum because it's very common for a serial killer to take a trophy. What is trophy? Body part. Body part. A nose, an ear, vagina, whatever. Body parts. This is the ultimate objectification. While the psychopath, will, the regular psychopath, will come to you and regard you as, an, as a bank account or as a sex machine or as a, and will treat you as a bank account or a sex machine or whatever until he gets what he wants. And if he doesn't get what he wants, he will get violent in most cases. That's a classic psychopath. The serial killer psychopath will treat you totally as object. He will kill, rape you, kill you, cut you off, and take you as souvenir, in most cases. It's called trophy. So this is the extreme, the extent to which it can get. This is the extent to which it can get. Narcissists will not cut you off, because they need you for narcissistic supply and so on and so forth. But they will not hesitate to damage you in other ways. They will take souvenirs from you in other ways, maybe not body parts, but other things. <coughs> There's now narcissists and psychopaths deserve uh, their own uh, but narcissists and psychopaths are extreme forms of mental illness. Yes. Uh, a question about the cold empathy. So is that something that <coughs> defines narcissists and psychopaths? It's only found uh, in narcissists, narcissists and psychopaths? Or is that something that they possess? Because there are a lot of uh, other examples of uh, social manipulators like social predators and uh, the liars. I don't remember. Okay. Uh, people who lie all the time. Ah, uh, pathological lies. Yeah, pathological lies. They do this, uh, they possess uh, a kind of cold empathy, but it's not what defines it. My contention, which is now common thinking, is that most of these people are narcissists and psychopaths, actually. Social predators, pathological lies, and so on, is a narcissistic or psychopath. Usually, if there is a money motivation and so on, they're psychopathic. If there is a motivation of aggrandizing them. Feel great, feel grandiose, it's usually not narcissistic. The difference between narcissists and psychopath is that the narcissist wants one thing and the psychopath another. Narcissist wants narcissistic supply, attention, grandiosity, inflation, self inflation, and so on. And psychopath wants practical things money, sex, and so on. Both of them manipulate, both of them lie, both of them uh, regard people as object and objects, and uh, so on. Cold empathy is a new. Suggestion, my suggestion, yeah, yeah. not, not well, part of the autonomous. But I suggest that I, I propose idea. that it's limited to us as You can go to my YouTube channel and there is a there is a video on the on, on there. Uh, my YouTube channel. Very original. How, okay. to, how to remember? Narcissists and psychopaths are extreme mental health cases. But dehumanization and objectification are common responses, much more common than narcissists and psychopaths. Narcissists and psychopaths together are less than 2% of the clinical population, population who gets to, to, the, to the mental health system. So it's a very small number of people. But objectification and dehumanization, treating people not as humans but as objects, that is much more common. Of course, a very famous example is the way Nazis regarded the Jews. They dehumanized the Jews. 
They made propaganda films comparing the Jews to mice, to vermin, to fleas, to viruses, and so on. They dehumanized the Jews, then they objectified the Jews. They treated the Jews as objects. They took them off the train, immediately dumped them in a, in a gas chamber, killed them in the gas chamber, burned the bodies, processed the bodies, made soap out of the bodies, converted them to real objects. So, in objectification and dehumanization are very common collective responses to conflict. Collective responses to conflict. When Rwanda, where Hutsis, uh, Tutsi and Hutus dehumanized, objectified each other. Whenever there's a conflict, especially an eruptive conflict, we dehumanize and objectify. Even with the Ebola epidemic, we have dehumanizing, objectifying reactions to people, especially since we isolate them, we put them away, you know, like they're objects, we put them away, we quarantine them. It's a logical and rational response, but it's also objectifying response. Whenever we're, we, whenever it's a collective, a collective, not individual, we're stressed, we're in conflict, we react, we become psychopaths. Simple. The Nazi period was a period of ascendant psychopathy. The psychopath was in charge, but the vast majority of Germans became psychopaths as well. Shared psychosis, coming back full circle. It's possible for a collective to become psychopathic or narcissistic. It is an infectious disease, an epid epidemic. We should not think of mental health as something unique or isolated to individuals. Individuals can and do infect each other with Ebola, but with psychopathy also. With malaria or tuberculosis, but also with uh, narcissism. We have collective responses and collective aid, mental health issues. The final topic. <laughs> the final topic is the current state of psychology. The dirty secret of psychologists as opposed as distinct from psychiatrists. Psychiatrists are also medical doctors. But the dirty secret of psychologists is that when they grow up, they want to be scientists. They want to feel that they are, that psychology is an exact science. They want to feel that they are physicists. They envy physicists. Physicists envy. I'm saying physicists because I'm physicists. So also physicists. So they envy physicists. Physicists deal with quantifiable elements. They have beautiful machines. They get Nobel Prizes. They're famous. They appear on Discovery Channel and uh, so on. It's very unnerving. Huge, envious reactions. And so, psychologists, psychologists, psychiatry has always been distinct from psychology. Psychiatrists always held psychologists in low regard, especially talk therapists. Psychiatrists always saw, thought that talk therapists are uh, quack doctors, shamans, you know, mm -hmm. witch doctors. So whenever you talk to a psychiatrist anywhere in the world, doesn't matter where, they will poo poo, they will be raped to the psychologists and definitely therapists. Talk therapy has always been considered kind of witchcraft, white magic, which it is not because it's been proven now, today, in the last two decades, it's been proven that talk therapy creates changes in the brain. The brain is very plastic. And talk therapy creates several types of changes in blood flow, in rewiring neural pathways. Neural pathways change with talk therapy, and so on. So talk therapy, properly administered, does have effects on the brain. And that is the joke on the part of the psychiatrists, yes? But still, psychiatrists believe that they are here and Psychologists and therapists should clean the toilets if possible. So why? Because psychiatrists have studied medicine, they have MD, in addition to psychology. I don't want to begin now about, about medicine, it's another topic altogether. But uh, I will limit my comments to psychologists and therapists, not to psychiatrists, for this distinction to be clear.
psychiatry, uh, psychologists and uh, therapists want to scientify, to make psychology more scientific. And how do you do that? By imitating and emulating the exact sciences. For instance, by using a lot of mathematics. So if you read modern papers in psychology, they are all with statistics, with mathematics, with matrices, and you know, everything looks very scientific. Differential uh, equations, and I don't know what. And the second way is to use machines. Because if you use machines, it is accurate, it's quantifiable, and it's objective. You can argue with the psychologist, you can argue with the therapist, but you can never argue with an MRI. Because MRI has colors, and that's it. That is a bit childish, a lot childish actually, for several reasons. And the only hope, the only hope for psychology, in my view, is this, whole, this part, this last segment, is my opinion. Only. In my view, the only hope to psychology, uh, for psychology is not in machines, more and more sophisticated, more and more costly, is not in mathematics, more and more complex, and no one understands, including the authors. It's in uh, philosophy. The only hope for psychology is in philosophy. And I don't mean philosophy, classical philosophy, but in in generating, in forming a philosophy of psychology, in adopting from philosophy the rigorous tests that philosophy applies to its disciplines, including philosophy of physics. My doctorate is in philosophy of physics. So this is where the hope lies. And I will give you a few examples. Psychiatrists are doctors. Psychiatrists are doctors. They give you pills. Most psychiatrists, the vast majority of psychiatrists, will give you pills. You come, they write a prescription, they give you medication. These are pill dispensing doctors. Only they don't treat your kidneys or heart, they treat your brain. So I don't, I'm not talking about them. They are medical discipline. We can talk about medicine some other time. It's on the phone. I'm talking about psychology, classical psychology modern psychology, and therapy especially. The first mistake that most modern psychologists make is that they confuse correlation with causation. In other words, they demonstrate that certain self-reports, because it's all self-reporting, you talk to a patient, the patient has to report. You are dependent on the patient. As a psychologist and a therapist, you are dependent on the patient. And that's the first big difference between psychology and physics. If I study the sun, I am not dependent on the sun. The sun is the sun, it continues in its cycles. I use my instruments and I measure the sun. The sun is there forever. My instruments are there forever. But if I talk to a patient, I am dependent on the patient's honesty, ability to introspect, introspection, uh, lack of defenses, uh, need need to be held. I'm, I'm totally dependent on the patient. Okay. What modern psychologists are trying to do, they are trying to correlate, they're trying to, sorry, they're trying to find which self-report by a patient goes with which objective phenomenon. So, on the one hand, they have self-report. Self-report. And on the other, they have objective Phenomenon. Example. Pain. Pain. <coughs> MRI. Color. So, pain. I prick, I prick the patient. Pain. And suddenly a part of the brain in the MRI lights up. Every time I prick the patient, the same area in the brain, lights up. Ah, say the modern psychologists, we found pain. Pain is this part of the brain. 
This part of the brain generates pain. And that is, of course, a very, very first year mistake in philosophy, but in philosophy. The big problem is that the vast majority of psychologists are not trained in rigorous logical thinking in philosophy. And I'm not kidding. There is a big difference between correlation and causation. This is correlation. Every time A, then B. Every time A, then B. But what caused what? Did A cause B? Or did B cause A? Can we establish causation? We cannot. There's no way to establish causation. And so the psychologists say it's not true. We can establish causation. If we stimulate this area, we stimulate this area of the brain with electrons. Yes? If we stimulate this area of the brain, we get pain. So this is causation. We first stimulate the area of the brain, and then we obtain the same effect. Therefore, it must be that the, this area of the brain generates or creates the pain. True. However, not the same experiment. Very true but not the same experiment. This and this are not the same experiment. You cannot learn from this experiment on this experiment. This experiment tells us nothing about this experiment. This is a very important distinction. One of the major problems in psychology, in psychology, is that we cannot repeat experiments. <coughs> experiments in psychology are not repeatable. If I make an experiment of this, I put it in fire, I put it in acid, I break it. I can repeat this experiment with very, very high degree of accuracy. Because Tony will get me another 50, and I will repeat the same thing with 50 of them. For you? <laughs> Not so sure. But if I make an experiment with 50 human subjects, 50 human subjects. Can I ever repeat this experiment with 50 other subjects? No. More. Can I ever repeat this experiment with the same 50 subjects? Never. Because the first experiment was Monday. The second experiment was Wednesday. In the meantime, you divorced. You had an accident. You didn't eat well. You didn't sleep well. <laughs> In Macedonia. So, <laughs> So, you are not the same subjects. By the second experiment on Wednesday, you are not the same subjects. It's a major problem in psychology. Experiments are not repeatable. One of the major demands in scientific method is that experiments can be repeated. Not possible in psychology. This is a total mix-up, which a first-year student in philosophy would be thrown out of their school. A leading to B, a, A and B happening simultaneously, and then B causing A, we can learn nothing from this or this or from this or this, because they are not the same experiment. So we have a problem of repeatability. We can't repeat experiments. We have a problem of self-reporting. We are depending on, dependent on the people in the experiments to tell us what they feel, what they do, what they do. You know, you know, you've heard of defense mechanisms. People deny, people forget, people suppress, people, people are not reliable test subjects. They lie. What do we have in modern psychology? When you go to, we just been to Cambridge and so on, when you go to these uh, faculties, what do we have? You have many, many psychologists. Working on MRIs, maybe. Today, the big, the big thing is MRI. And they are producing dozens of studies, thousands of studies, mapping brain activity compared to self reports by patients. Does this tackle the core issue? Your raw material is a problem. The patients, the people, that's the problem. The raw material you're working on, that's your problem. Not what you do. 
due to these raw materials, not which machines you are using. <coughs> it's the raw materials. I will go further. Imagine that they check a group of 10 people in MRI. So they have brains, they have uh, beautiful color maps and so on. And then they need to repeat, because if you don't repeat, it's meaningless. And many of these tests are not repeated. They are once, and that's it. But okay, you need to repeat. With the same 10 people, again, are they the same 10 people? The same, am I the same Sam Wagner that I was yesterday? No, I'm not the same Wagner. Never. I'm changing minute to minute, hour to hour. I can never be the same test subject. Psychology is uh, psychology is in a dead end today. In a dead end because it is trying to be a science. It lacks the philosophic rigorousness and philosophical underpinnings, especially in logic and understanding of scientific methods, philosophy of science. It lacks all this. It is using machinery which is an objective element on non-objective test subjects which change constantly and cannot, experiments cannot be repeated. It's stuck completely. The history of psychology can be roughly divided to three periods. Roughly, you can divide it to 20 periods, but roughly to three. And with this, I'm finished. Up until the 1860s, up until the 1980s, and now. Up until the 1860s, the study of the human mind, <coughs> study of the human mind, which is what we call psychology, was an integral part of philosophy. As, by the way, was physics. Physics was an integral part of philosophy. So, it was called natural philosophy. So, the study was an integral part of philosophy. It had its limitations. The fact that it was amalgamated with philosophy had its limitations, of course. But it has its strong points, because philosophy, what philosophy teaches you? Philosophy teaches you to think. It doesn't teach you anything, in my view. Not really anything about the world or anything. But it teaches you one thing perfectly, to think. And so, these people who wrote philosoph psychological texts before 1860, more or less, at least they knew how to think. You can see rigorous thinking in the text. Between 1860 and 1980, this was the artistic phase, artistic phase. So you had people like Freud with psychoanalysis and after that uh, uh, other schools, including quasi pseudo-scientific schools like behaviorism and so on. You had these schools and they were writing narratives. They were writing s stories. They were narrative, narrative psychology. It was a little like movie scripts. They were writing movies about the mind. No one saw an ego, or a super ego, or an id, or, you know. But it was a nice literary creation. It was more literature than, than science. And it was artistic, and it was narrative, and it was a story about how the mind behaves. Until more or less the 1980s. Starting with Freud, or even before Freud, Breuer and so on, and ending, let's say, with object relations, Kohut, Winthrop, uh, and others. Starting in the 1980s, we have the pseudo-scientific phase. Pseudo-scientific phase, which uses mathematics and machines. Machines, and this is the medicalization of psychology. Psychology is a branch of scientific medicine. Where will this lead? I don't know. Because when these people came to control psychology, which they do now, they got rid of all of this. They said that all this is garbage. It's not scientific, cannot be proved, it's nonsense, it's art, it's I don't know what. And therefore, we should ignore. Not a single, not a single university in the United States teaches for it. <coughs> If you want to study psychoanalysis and modern psychoanalysis, post Freud, of course, there's a lot, a lot of work done in, for instance, in the 70s. I mentioned Kohut, Kernberg, and others. If you want to study object relations, object relations schools are a derivative of psychodynamic uh, psychology, which is derivative of psychoanalysis, or whole field, child field, and so on. If you want to study any of this, 
You need to go to the psychoanalytic institute in New York. You can't go to any university. You can't go to Harvard. You can't go to Yale or Princeton or anywhere. That no one teaches this yet. It's considered garbage. <coughs> so they, they threw all of it, all this giant thing, they threw it to the garbage. Today you go to, so you don't have to believe me, you can go online and look at the curriculum, the syllabus of Harvard. I'm going to go to any university, especially in California. Go to any university to study psychology, you will study electronics, mathematics, uh, machines like MRI, this, uh, you will study statistical behavior, interpretation, demographics, <coughs> epidemiology, and so on. In all these syllables, one thing is missing the human, the human mind, and the human, and the human is a test site. And how to overcome the fact? that we are locked inside, locked inside, communicate with each other through an uh, intersubjective agreement, indirectly, all of us. I will finish with a famous story of the French um, editor of a fashion magazine. I don't know if you saw this movie, it's a stunning movie, it's a book also. I mean, it's a book first, movie second. He was the editor of a fashion magazine, and one day he took his son, his divorce, he took his son to a sports game or something. And on the way he had a stroke. He had a stroke in a car, in his car. And he was picked up and he brought to a hospital, was brought to a hospital. And he had something which we call locked in syndrome. Locked in syndrome. Locked in syndrome is when your mind <coughs> functions perfectly. Functions perfectly. But all your body, so all your bodily functions are destroyed. You can move nothing. Nothing. Not a finger, not a nothing. You are locked inside. As a perfect human being, no, no, no cognitive function is impaired. You're perfect. You still think the same. You everything. So this guy was locked in. He was able to move his low the lower lid of his left eye. The lower lid, like that. Only this. Nothing, no other part of his body. Only the lower lid. He hired, a, uh, I mean, somehow, succeeded to really, to hire a, a woman, a nurse, you know, a woman, a secretary. He developed a system where the letter A is this, the letter B is this, the letter C is three. And he dictated a bestseller. He dictated a big bestseller. I mean, like 700 pages, you know, very big. Using his eye only. That's all. Moving his eye like this, blinking. With the blinks. Letter by letter. Can you imagine this? The human mind. The will. Willpower. The willpower. The man was lowered in evidence. His body was finished. You know, all his functions were performed by other people and other machines. Only his eye moved, only the lid of his eye, and he dictated the whole book. Capture this with an MRI. Show me the mathematics to describe this. It's bullshit. The new direction of psychology is utter nonsense. Philosophically non-rigorous. And ignoring subject matter itself, the thing that stands at the center and should always stand at the center, the human mind, the true subject of our study, is gone. You do not find the word human mind in the Harvard syllabus of psychology, the entire syllabus. You don't have to trust it, you? you do not find the word mind in the entire syllabus. I think also much more. Thank you.
so that question is. Uh, yeah. I hope you know. Your no, no, English is great. Yeah. That's something for this time. So, yeah. 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 Uh, I will answer in Hebrew. <laughs> 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 um, it's not about does uh, history yeah. repeat itself. It's I mean it does, yeah. but it's because uh, the human uh, mind can only um, respond in a cloud of responses. Like uh, let's say to a conflict, he can uh, run away, he can run back. So that's why uh, there. Um, no, when I say repeated of means that if I make a test on you today and a test yeah. on you tomorrow, you are not the same person. So that's what I mean. Not that you can yeah, repeat it. Repeat it. So that we get the point. So. Um, it's uh, because of uh, humans that they have learned that uh, set of responses, but uh, history repeats itself. itself and uh, that's why, uh, like, at the beginning, uh, there was uh, sociology, was much more complicated, and uh, they divided it into branches, to sad, sad, sad. And uh, that's what happened when the psychologists <laughs> other schools. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, that's going to happen in the future. Uh, there's going to be old school psychology and there's going to be new school psychology, but it's, not, it's probably going to be named different. So it's going to be a new science. There is neuro, neuro so science. It's, it's neuro not, science. Yeah, there is but it's not other bullshit. Like you said. No, no, bullshit in, in terms of psychology. Yeah, yeah. In terms of neuroscience, but it's probably uh, when you try to when you try to take from it uh, reminds me when you sometimes you go to all kinds of Islamic and they talk about energy. Energy is a term in physics as a clear definition. You know, the minute you take it out of context and you bring it to another field and you misuse it, you are Islamic. So for me, the minute the minute you are taking. The minute you are detaching, the minute you are calling this psychology, you are in a way not rigorous, I don't want to say, but not rigorous. Same activity is being done in neuroscience. The neuroscience departments, they don't make any psychological claims, they don't analyze anyone psychologically. It's talking the brain. They don't make claims, interdisciplinary claims, you understand? They study the brain and they say, okay, when there is a pain, there is reaction here. They don't make any claims that are supposedly about the human mind. Understand? Yeah, but it is this cross that I'm against. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. And I don't call it psychology. It's uh, happening right now. The future is just like it's happening right now. It's dividing into two, but it's slowly. It, it, it's What's dividing it? slowly. So uh, until they make a whole new science, they'll also call it psychology. Although I'm more pessimistic than you, I think the machines will take over. In other words. Everyone wants to be so so scientific that I think the parts that are not describable with mathematics and are not describable with machine activity will be neglected to the point that they will vanish. I think what you call old psychology, I think, will die because no one is teaching it, and uh, there, there's no new generations, no continuation. No Paradoxically, only in non-Western countries you still have still have this going on. So in India, for instance, you have flourishing. Flourishing uh, schools of psychodynamic therapy and so on. But uh, in the West, it's, uh, it's dying. Why in the West is dying? Because everyone is looking for money, and you yeah. can't get money for this kind of thing. You can get money for MRI. It's easy to explain, easy to show beautiful charts with color, and this mathematics. Everyone says mathematics must be true. You know? So the whole thing is done bad. bad. Uh, here in Psychology faculty was first established in philosophy. Yes, so they made a connection at the time. They, it was normal for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, psychology, uh, uh, no, psychiatry is in, uh, medicine. in medicine. Is it true? So it is divided. Is it I mean, it was like that. Is it true? I just hope that the time will not come that they will mix up everything. As it should be. I have nothing against studying the brain. Why would I have anything against studying the brain? Also, should study the brain. But to call it psychology, as, men, as most psychologists are doing today, that is to misrepresent what psychology is and what are the possibilities and limitations of psychology. 
It's very important. It's important to know when you're in a discipline what you can and cannot do. You know what it reminds me? I'm watching Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, a physicist, great or not, it's debatable. I, I, I used to work with one of his uh, students, and his student, Beckenstein, claims that he stole his work. But that's beside the point. Stephen Hawking is a physicist. Suddenly I see him on television talking about God. I don't know what uh, the meaning of uh, life. What the fuck, you know? You're a physicist. You know, it is this uh, misuse of your authority, professional authority. And he is not speaking as a layman who wants to express his opinion. No, he's speaking as an authority because he's a physicist. You know, he touched God. He, he knows. He, this is wrong. This is wrong. All these phenomena are wrong. It's like asking a, a, movie, a movie star uh, about uh, foreign policy because it's famous. It is the, the, it is the cult of celebrity. And psychologists, modern psychologists in the West want to be celebrities. They want money. They want power. They want to be on the media. They want to... And can you be on the media in, with a lecture like this? No. Trust me. But can you be I on the media with nice color charts from an MRI? You can. And you are. And you are. It's a, a big problem. All, the, all the psychology was concerned with human, human mind. The new psychology is concerned with the brain. It basically all comes to the cultures again. It basically comes to the confusion between brain and human mind. But uh, what do you think uh, about the writers? Are they narcissistic or not? Narcissistic? No, yes, narcissistic. Some writers are narcissistic, some not. It's not about what you do, it's how you do it. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. If, if, what you, if you do what you do, in order, mainly in order to obtain adulation, admiration, 